Welcome to Baruch Church. It's such a blessing to have each and every one of you. So thank you for, for joining us um, during this time. I've got somewhat a little bit of a bad news for you guys. If you are here for the first time this morning, you're kind of coming in at the end of a conversation, okay? We, we've been having a lot of conversations for many minutes. And you guys remind me every Sunday how many minutes we had a conversation for. So we, we had a lot of conver- um, conversations, um, which we feel is very important for the general church to know. And this morning is going to be a conclusion of all of this. What you're going to hear this morning is nothing new. What we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to look at the individual elements that we've spoken about. And we're just going to consider them in a context. Because for us as a church, it's important that you don't walk away feeling good. We want you to walk away and feeling in love with this book that we read. That's, that's very, very important. Because if you don't open this book, your relationship with God will lack. Because this is where we learn from Him, and this is where we understand the story of Yahweh in Israel. And what I want to do today is we're going to zoom a little bit out, and we're going to look at the overall picture and how these things fit in together. And, and my biggest agenda this morning is, I want you to understand that when you read the Bible, there's a bigger narrative that we're talking about. And you're doing injustice to the word if you take Psalm 23 and extract one verse and apply that promise to your life, not considering that there's a bigger story taking place. And so we have a a selfish religion today where we look at how we can benefit, benefit from the text. But if you are willing to believe what stands in this book, you will know that this, can, I don't want to use the word religion, but for, for practical terms, let's refer to this as a religion. For practical terms, this religion is cost a lot of people an expensive price. And if this book doesn't offend you, you're not reading it properly. Because the Bible is offensive. You know why? Because it challenges our flesh. And every time you sit in church and there's no conflict inside of your heart, you are not reading this book properly. Because when you read this book properly, it will challenge every fiber in your flesh. Because we feel one thing and this Bible kind of tells us another thing. And we're going to talk about the contention that exists between knowing and feeling. And so what we're going to do today, we're going to zoom a little bit out to look, think about all the things that we've spoken about. Put it down in, in, in what my wife very aggressively refers to as my boxes that she doesn't understand. But the boxes make sense for me. My desire is that you will understand that this is a living book. And this is not a dead letter that is rules and regulations to manipulate us or to make wealth from. Yes, people do that using these texts. But this morning we want to have a bigger picture and we're going to look at that. So the theme this morning is the conclusion. I don't know why Lionel made it like a horror movie, but uh, <laughs> the conclusion. I don't know. October, Halloween, I don't know what's going on. Kom, ek begin praat voordat ek verder. I want to warn you, this introduction is going to sound like an advert, but I don't mean for it to sound like an advert. I want to give you some some plain elements. I want to explain to you my thought process and what I do in order to read the Bible and and go through these these elements. So the first thing that I want to mention to you, you can put up the first one and it's going to be Logos. Oh, you've got Faith Life Connect, nice and squashed, wonderful. Um, Put up the, the, the Logos picture for me, please. I use software called Logos, Logos Bible Software. It's a phenomenal piece of equipment. It's, it's really, really awesome. Um, it's, it's a company that combines the text with technology. And when you combine that, the, the way you can search the Bible is phenomenal. What I want to just mention quickly, what Logos does not do, it doesn't spoon feed you the information. So it's not, su- it's not a program where you sit back and everything is done for you. But Logos, what it does, it puts tools in your hand to understand and read the Bible. If I can take one plain example is when you open up your Bible, you will have your normal translation. Let's say I use the ESV and next to that you will have an exegetical guide which puts the text in the original Greek language and it breaks it down and explains it. Um, When I use Greek, it's not because I'm smart and super intelligent. It's because I use programs and spend a lot of time in the week in order to gain the information. So I want you to think of Lucas like a shovel. You know, when you're looking for something, it's just an effective tool and looking for the things. Now, 
The nice thing about Lucas is the base package is completely free, and I don't get any money from this, so that's why I warned you before the time is going to sound like an advert. I want to give you, I want to explain to you how I read the Bible, and maybe if you want to, you can use these tools. It's completely free. But the problem with Lucas is that the base package, you need content in order to use this, okay? And what they do is you can purchase commentaries and original texts from them. You can purchase Bibles from them and you load this up into this program. And when you search the word Logos, um, for example, it will give you a nice word search from the Bible and not from the internet where everyone's got an opinion out there. Sometimes Google is fantastic. But you need to be careful what you Google because you will have a lot of opinions out there. And this is a scary part because I feel we need to look at what the Bible says. Not what opinion says, what the, what the Bible says. What is the Bible saying? And sometimes, as I said, it can be a little bit offensive, offensive, but it's important to understand that we look at it. So what I do with Lucas Bible software is because commentaries are ridiculously expensive, because t- please take a note, professors and teams work on the Bible for 20, 30 years, and then they put their research in a book, and then we want to pay a 10 rand for a book that, it, that has taken a lifelong study of the Bible to draw our text. So that's, that's why it's expensive. So what I do is I've got a Faith Life Connect subscription, which is a fuller package of Logos, but you don't buy the commentaries. It's like a monthly fee that you pay and you have access. It's like a monthly fee you pay and you've got access to this vast library of information. And now the, the, uh, there's no easy way around this. There's, there's no easy way around this. If you want to finish school, you've got to open some books and you've got to study some books, okay? That's how it works. If you want to study the Bible, it's going to take some effort, it's going to take some time, and you have to open some books and you have to read. And I'm going to be honest with you, um, and this is no reference to the Bible, but the idea of study is boring. Like the idea of eating healthy is boring. But if we want the results you have to make the sacrifices. There's no way around this. Um, sadly, that's just the only way that it works. But in any case, so I use Bible, um, Logos Bible software, phenomenal package. I don't have time to show you all the things. Um, and then I've got a Faith Life subscription that opens up this program where I get all my content from. And this is now the two next things is extremely important. The people who's been influencing my theology the most in my life recently is a guy named Michael Hazer, Dr. Michael Hazer. Um, he's much more friendlier than what, okay, no, he's not friendly. He's just when you say, I hear his voice, it's like, it's, it's like very monotonous, but the content is so powerful that he can say it in any way he wants to. He's, he's just a phenomenal mind. He's just really, really phenomenal. And he specializes when it comes to the cultural information of the time when the Bible is written. And he specializes in languages that does not exist anymore. And so what he does is he looks at the time when, when Job was written, and he looks at the literature literature of the same time outside Israel in order to understand how the cultural or the world views affected the people that was writing the Bible. Phenomenal. I don't have time to jump into this, but I just want to mention if, if you want to listen to someone and you want to expand your understanding of the Bible, that's the, the guide to look to, especially when it comes to the Older Testament. And then one of the coolest old guys, uh, Bishop Enti, right? This guy is so cool because he's got, he's got a very sexy voice. I'm going to just say it right here, right now. I'm going to be honest. When he speaks, man, it sounds like honey running down. Uh, it's, oh, it's just, I mean, he, he can tell me a Disney story. He can read a Disney story and it will be beautiful. And um, Bishop Enti, right, is a specialist in the New Testament. And the way he reads it, especially when it comes to the Pauline letters, he's a phenomenal mind. He studied this his whole life. And so he's a big, big influencer when it comes to New Testament theology in today's time. Now, obviously, um, the people that I mentioned, they have their critics. um, So don't just take everything. You need to read the Bible. You need to listen to what the other guys are saying. But don't just take this because we all interpret texts from our own background. Now, I don't want to bore you with all this. I'm going to start preaching. But I just want to give credit to these guys because this is how I formulate my sermons. And this is the tools I use in order to build. So when you see me bringing down a sermon or explaining certain elements, it's not that when I read the Bible, these things always spring up at me or jump out at me. Most of the time, it's because I've been influenced by phenomenal theology 
theologians that's been doing this for years, and they just bring out these beautiful elements for us um, that just brings this Bible alive. Now, adverts done and dusted, we're going to jump into one I want to preach um, about this morning, the conclusion. We're going to start with a, a, a framework which N.T. Wright's put up, and if you've been here, we talked about the five-act play. I don't know, I'm not sure if you guys can remember the five-act play, and you can jump to the Old Testament quickly for me. Um, about the five act play. I just want to give the, the five acts quickly. You can just put the yes, yes, yes. So the five acts is within the Old Testament, it's the good creation. We're talking about the, 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 the full story of the Bible as a whole. I'm just breaking it down quickly for you. Act one is the good creation. Act two, rebellion. You guys know about Nachash and all those wonderful things. We act three is about Israel. And in the New Testament, We've got Jesus Christ, and then Act 5 is incomplete, and I've spoken about that, and we're just going to break this down. Now, let me start. In our Bibles, we've got an Old Testament, and we've got a New Testament. There's our two separate boxes that we're going to build out of. The first thing that I want you to understand, and this is probably the most important aspect that I want you to understand. The Old Testament does not mean irrelevant testament. Old does not mean irrelevant, and I feel sometimes that the word Old Testament, especially when it comes to the Pentecostal churches that I've been exposed to, feels like a lot of sermons is focused on the New Testament, and I don't have an issue with that, I don't have a problem, I believe in Jesus dying and res being resurrected, but you miss a lot of depth within the context of the New Testament if you consider the Old Testament as irrelevant, okay? It's not irrelevant, but what happens is when we read, when we read the Old Testament, it tends to be a little bit boring because, first of all, we can't pronounce half of the names that we are reading because, holy moly, I support Owens with Snarks and Armour in the Bible. And then added to that, it doesn't feel relevant. So what I want to do is, I want to show you the bigger picture, and hopefully when you read David and Goliath, I want you to understand that we're looking with our eyes at someone who threw a stone, but it's part of a bigger narrative that God is trying to explain to us. And when we zoom in on David and Goliath, yes, we can take some beautiful sermons out of that. But if you don't understand that God is trying to tell us something, it's going to be selfish consistently and it's going to be focused around us. So, Old Testament, New Testament. And within those two boxes, we're going to have pillars that I want you to, to lay a foundation for when we read the Bible. And it's going to be all about this. This breakdown of the five-act play. Okay, you can put up the next slide. We're going to start with the Old Testament. And our Bible opens up with this idea that we've been created in God's image. Um, can you put up that verse for me, please? Yes. I don't want to read this to you. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Next one. There's just three verses, I think. So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Pillar number one is Act One, the good creation. Our Bible opens up with the story of Genesis. And anybody that lives today will know there's a lot of conflict between science and Genesis. If you just and, and you know, I think the, the the tension is so tight with regard to that that people are walking away out of the church, not believing what Genesis says, because science comes out with I don't want to call it proof, but very interesting theories that they can kind of prove and base. And now we feel that it's, that it's clashing. Now, I just want to mention something about this before I touch on anything else. Genesis is not a scientific book. Yeah. Uh, I Man, if there's one thing about this act that you can walk away with is Genesis is not written as a scientific book. There's a lot of symbolism in there. There's a lot of narrative being written in there. And I think we do injustice to Genesis, if we take a modern scientific and calculating mind and you put those glasses on and you try to read Genesis, that is no, they didn't even understand germs. Gravity didn't even exist. Now, I don't mean that it's floating. I'm talking about the, the idea of gravity did not even exist 
back then. They did not understand that we're going to fly up to the moon and walk around there and have some casual flights that, uh, that's actually been happening with SpaceX recently as well. You're going to have commercial flights to space. You can check out Earth from there and you can come back. They did not understand these elements. All they knew is they've got this relationship, this idea of God. They've got this, 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 this being and they're seeing these wonder miracles taking place and then they're writing out of their context. Now I'm not saying that God did not create the heavens and the earth. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we need to be careful to evaluate Genesis with a scientific modern biology or cosmology or whatever the terms are with regards to that because it becomes dangerous. Okay. The point of Genesis is this and you will have heard this so many times from our pulpit that God created Eden on earth, and he desired to have a family. And added to that is he created man in his image. Just, just an interesting point quickly. A lot of, especially when you look at Mesopotamia and, and the, the cultures around there, there was many gods, okay, many, many gods. And many of them had images. They had shapes, they had forms, they had shrines, they had all of these elements. But when it comes to Yahweh, he strictly ordered people that you can't make an image of him. There were strict rules that you can't mold Yahweh into a shape and put him down somewhere so that people can worship. And the idea around this is, it opens up in Genesis and it says, God made us in his image. As Dr. Michael Hazer refers to this, we are the images of God. And then when you read Genesis, you notice that the story goes on further. And never mind about creation, dominion is given to the images of God, to Adam and Eve, to man. Man has been given the authority, the dominion, the logic brain. We have been given this, this can I use this word, this godly power to manage that which he has given unto us. That's the story of Genesis. And sometimes when we read it too close, we sometimes forget what the author is trying to explain to us. And now we're arguing, is six days a day or thousands of years? And how does this work? Let me tell you, I have no idea. I wasn't there, okay? I wasn't there. I didn't see anything. Man, I can't even remember what I had yesterday for lunch, okay? I did, I really, I can't, I can't. So the point being is we need to be careful that we, that we draw out scientific elements. The point being is the author is explaining that God made a family and he made us in his image and said, now you go and have dominion on earth. And we've got this idea that God wants to come down to earth and create a family. And it's extremely complex when we think about heaven and earth and how it kind of overlaps. But there's this idea that there's, there's, there's a spiritual realm and then our Bible talks about an earthly realm, realm and our God is, is, is integrated with what we are doing. But he's not here anymore. He's not walking amongst us. He's not sitting there in front of me in a physical body. Because dominion has been handed over to us and says, you are my family. I want you to make decisions. And that's where all hell kind of broke loose. When he started giving us dominion and making us, giving us choices. With regards to um, act number two, the big rebellion that took place. Now, you guys will know this extremely well. Pastor, I did a phenomenal job teaching about this. Can you put up that picture for me about the, um, the zooming part about Genesis, please? So our Bible talks about creation taking place, this idea of Adam and Eve, and ach, people have been interpreting that in multiple ways. But we notice that we are part of God's family and He gives us choices to make and our choices kind of leaned on doing our own thing. And throughout the history of mankind, you will notice that God says one thing, but we desire something else. It's consistently this battle of turning away from God and doing things the way we want to do it. It's, it's this tension between spirit and, and flesh that takes place. Any case, and what happens is, Act 2, the story of the Bible, is about how man 
rebelled against God. And we've got stories about um, Adam and Eve and the, the tree of life. We've got stories of the sons of God. If, if that's unfamiliar, we don't have time to dis- discuss that. Poshion did, a, as I said, a phenomenal job. If you want to find out more about that, you can come speak to us. And then we've got the Tower of Babel. And the point being is, if we get stuck with scientific searching, we're going to miss the story. The story is, Act 1, God's good creation. He made us in His image and says we need to have dominion of the earth. And we kind of turned away slowly over many years and we kind of did our own thing and sin kind of creeped in. So when we read of Cain and Abel, for example, Cain and Abel, don't get too stuck up in the story. Yes, there's sermon values, but zoom out and understand the story is that we are turning away from how God wants things to happen. And we sometimes get a little bit stuck in what does this mean for me? And what value can I pull out of this for me? And what blessing and promise can I pull out for me? But that's not kind of how this works. There's a bigger story with regards to this. Okay, So be careful that we nitpick small little elements in that. Act 3. Now, there's a lot of rebellion in this. <laughs> when, when rebellion pops in, you will notice that even today we struggle with that. Even, even today we struggle with that because the flesh is real, emotions is real, and it's kind of pushing us away from God. Now, Israel pops up on the scene. God is fed up with people. He's tired. He's emotionally drained. If he's got, I think God's got emotions. Uh, he's, he's emotionally drained. And <laughs> he, as we refer to, he divorces the nations and he says, I'm, I'm done with people. I'm done with people. Kind of scary thought when we, when we think about that. Yeah. I just maybe want to jump this in here. If you think God is ruthless, let me explain this to you. God never turned away from us. Every single story you read in the Bible is where we turned away from God. And then our feeling is God is so judgmental. No, ladies and gentlemen. God has been giving us these guidelines and rules and regulations. And when I say rules and regulations, I'm not talking about wearing a tie. He's giving us this idea of take care of the earth, take care of the world. And we're still battling to do that now because we are on a downward spiral with regards to certain health um, elements. And God says, uh, this is what we need to do. We need to treat each other right. And then what we do? We murder each other. We steal from each other because these fleshly desires of greed and all these elements. And so every time when God looks at us, we turn our back on Him. And then when bad things happen, we say, what did you do? But we excluded him and says, we don't need you. We want to do it this way. And this is what's nice and comfortable for us. And we don't need your input. This works. And so that's where the tension comes in. Interesting to note that when it comes to Israel and war and stuff taking place, it was considered that if you beat a other nation in, in a war, that the God of the victorious nation, he's the ruler. And so now when we think of that in that concept, when Israel was defeated, the idea sometimes is that Yahweh was defeated. But that's where the prophet comes in and they write this over and over and over again. It's not that Yahweh is defeated, it's that we turned away from Him and we did our own thing and this is what happens because we don't have Yahweh as our God anymore because we shifted away and then guys like Isaiah and Jeremiah, for example, Daniel, they're shouting out over and over, return to Yahweh because He is our restorer. Return back to Him. And so sometimes we miss the story when we zoom into Isaiah and only read one passage and we look for how I can use this passage to build up some motivation to send my CV in and you're missing that because the picture is God is explaining something to us. Act 1, being created in God's image. We are part of this creation. Act 2 is this big rebellion that took place. Act 3 is we've got this whole idea of God still being frustrated with man but still choosing to take a portion for himself and says, man, I long to be with you. I long to be reconciled to my people. You must actually search this up how many times the Bible, especially the Old Testament says that I will be your God and you will be my people. That that term is, is used numerous times. And you can see it's like a father. 
I mean, your son can be as bad as he wants to, and you get a point where you just draw a line and says, enough is enough, and you throw him out the house. And then after a while, you begin to say, man, it's my son. Let's try one more time. You see this in people in houses where, where drugs is a problem. You know why? Because it's difficult for a mom to put out their child even when they are bad. It's difficult not to give money to your son or your daughter even though they're doing bad things because you are concerned about that. And there are days when you just draw a line and say enough is enough and then there are days that you find yourself helping them in their bad habits just all over again. I'm not saying God is helping us in our bad habits. I'm explaining to you this idea of God being a father and really we are doing our own thing but still the God of creation is looking and waiting for us. To listen and, and return. In any case, I'm digressing now. So Israel comes in and he, he picks up a guy called Abraham. And I'm just going to read this quickly to you. Um, the, the call of Abraham. Yes, Genesis 12. Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great. So that you will be a blessing. Verse 3. I will bless those who bless you and I will dishonor you. Ach, dis, yeah. I, and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Why I mention this verse is because I need you to understand that first century Christians drew on this promise to understand how the gospel was spread to many nations. It was difficult for them to understand this, but this is an important verse. Paul uses this especially to explain the promise came first. And, and, and when I say these words come, and you guys need to link this up with sermons we had in the past about the promise came first and the law came later. We talked about this extensively throughout this year. So the point being is, when God comes and He chooses Israel, He says, now I'm going to explain my greatness through this nation of Israel but you guys need to be holy because I am holy and you need to follow these guidelines because this is what's important and this is how I design things to function and to work and now the entire rest of the Old Testament is the story of Israel and Yahweh Israel and Yahweh so we like to read stories about Elijah and Elisha and the miracles that happened but we miss what is taking place in the story because Yahweh is showing us a relationship between Israel with the purpose of blessing all the nations. Yeah. Now we've got stuff like <laughs> the Assyrian war that's taking place between Israel and Assyria and how Israel was defeated because of sin taking place. You've got the Babylonian exile that's taking place. It's all these stories in the, in the later part of, of um, the, the, the Old Testament. Now I want you to understand quickly, we see God and Abram with this beautiful promise, but you see Israel still being exiled and being dominated by other world powers. And then we get these little bit of hints here and there with the rest of the text. Where God comes and He says, I've still got a plan, but you need to listen to me. And this is where this, the, the theory or the theology of the Messiah comes in. Now, we're still in the Old Testament. It's building up to the New Testament. Today we understand that Jesus comes here, but there's a build up to this. And we spoke about this, where, where Israel is selected and the holy nation to be the blessing. And God speaks to David and he says to him, I will make you a house. Can you guys remember that part? Is, is the verse up there? Did I put it up there? Second Samuel. Didn't I put it in? Yes, I put it up there. We preached about this. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the, sorry, Yahweh, it's God, I'm speaking to David after this nation of Israel has been established. The Lord declares that the Lord will make you a house. And I preached about this. If you weren't here, I'm very sorry. You're going to miss half of what we, I'm trying to explain to you this morning. But you need to understand that God is promising David that I will make you a family, a house. When we refer to it as the house of David, the house of David, it's a reference to his family, to his bloodline. And God selects Israel and says, now David is this phenomenal guy who's, who's a, a, a man after my own heart. And I'm going to make him a house. And then further on, the verses goes to, um, just check there for me where the part says where I will resurrect um, 
When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring, raise up your offspring. And first century Christians looked at this verse and it says, I will raise up, I will resurrect your seed. I will resurrect your seed. And this is where after Jesus was resurrected, they saw this little bit of hints in the text with regards to what's taking place. Now again, when we zoom in, we see David and Goliath. When we zoom out, it's God big plan to restore his relationship with man. Everyone still still with me here? I mean, I, I don't have time to, to break this down. We've, we've did that already. Now, after this, I will make you, I will make you a house. There's, there's two other little bit of hints. Isaiah, um, was it 55 or 52? You can put up that um, 52. Now we see the prophets and, and um, the, the, after Solomon's time, the Israelites turned their back on God and they were worshiping Baal and you've got Ahab and Jezebel and all those stories that we read and we focus in so much about Jezebel and we like to refer to our grand our mother-in-laws as Jezebels and when we don't like people in the church, they are Jezebel spirit and just because someone jumped in front of you in the line, they are Jezebel. It's got nothing to do with people. People. It's got everything to do with man turning their back on God consistently. And we like to, to use the text for our advantage and we weaponize that. But the point being is that Yahweh is fighting for the hearts of his people because they tend to turn away again. And so because they turned away, war takes place and all hell breaks loose. And now they want to know what's going on. Does Yahweh even exist? Is he even real? Because we are exiled and then hints come up like this. In, as, the, as the nation of Israel is, is, is in exile and they are in war and bad things are happening, Isaiah prophesies in Rise, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings what? Good news. Interesting, interesting that in the New Testament this whole idea of Jesus would be referred to as good news. But in any case, who publishes peace and who brings good news of happiness. The next one. Who publishes salvation, who says to Zion or Jerusalem, your God reigns. It's very big words to say when you claim that Yahweh is the God, but you are a slave nation being dominated by the other gods, the Babylonians, the gods of the Babylonians and the gods of the Assyrians. And what is happening in the story is that the prophets, phenomenal, by the way, in today's time when prophets prophesy, we get wunderflies because they say next year you're going to have a new house and you're going to be wealthy. Prophets in the Bible always warn people to turn back to God and otherwise you are going to die. Okay, that's and you know what happened to the prophets? Jeremiah was locked up. The enemies, the Babylonians who attacked them, they released Jeremiah. His own people didn't release him. Being a prophet in the Old Testament was a very dangerous job because you always had the responsibility of turning or speaking to people and ask them to turn their way. Again, can I just jump in this with, with the way we do church today? It's selfish. Because prophets are this lucky charm that give us this blessing of words that make us feel good. No, a prophet's job is to turn your heart back to God and address issues which you don't want to address. Any case, I'm just, just throwing that out for, for, for free. I know it's not going to be very comfortable, but it is what it is. What was our business saying? Oh, and then we get to, to, to Daniel as well. Remember? And Daniel, now Isaiah was in the Assyrian um, um, war of exile that took place. And then later on, the same thing happened with Babylon as well. And then Daniel stands up. And we, we spoke about Daniel in the lion's den. Um, Daniel 6 about Daniel in the lion's den. And it was referring to Daniel 7 about this beautiful prophetic word of the Son of Man coming and his throne being established. So later on in the Old Testament, you see these hints, these, these hints of of refreshment, these hints of God restoring the plan that he had in Genesis over and over and over again and again. If you read Malachi and use that only to get people to give more money to the church, you're missing the point of why Malachi was written in the first place. You see, even people inside the church manipulate scripture for their benefit, but there's a bigger story. And it's about God and man being reconciled, not getting more money out of your pockets and not getting boldness to go apply for a new job and not asking God, is that my throw throw? I don't know, man. I don't know. The last time someone blamed God, it was Adam and Eve and there was a big argument. So I think God just doesn't give any advice anymore. He said, I'm going to buta. a contract and that's your thing now. That's your thing 
No, we, we, we sometimes get so selfish with our faith. And God, is, He gave us a book. He says, listen, it's about reconciling the way we do things with the way God wants things to be done and reconciling our relationship with Him. But we are stuck in having fun church today. That's why sermons like this will bore people to death because you are not feeling motivated to go gym tomorrow. You are not feeling encouraged to face tomorrow. No, I'm giving you substance of what stands in the Bible. My question is, can you handle what stands in the Bible? Can you, can you handle it that it's not so much about these material things? Okay, and we struggle to handle that. Because church has become a motivational hub. You know how I know that? Because the, the prayer room is empty and the coffee area is full. And, and I'm not pointing finger. I'm not someone that prays for, for two hours a day. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm not criticizing. I'm just saying our priority is shifted to, to what, is, what tastes good to me in order about what the purpose is of why I, why I came up to today. And it's consistently what we can get out of this. And over and over, God says, I've been making you images and you've got this family. And then you guys walked away. And then I tried again with the nation of Israel and they turned away over and over again. And it was so frustrating. Okay, in my opinion... Where, where God just almost gave up and says, okay, so do what you guys need to do. And then when you are done, I'll be waiting like the prodigal son. Yeah. I desire you, but if you don't want me, you don't want me. Yeah. Because he's given us this free will, this free will. Can I just put this out there as well? Why are we making so much noise out there in the world? Why are we fighting with people that don't believe in God? Let pe God gives us a choice. Now we want to fight about people out there that doesn't even believe in Yahweh. You can't fight with someone that doesn't believe in a God that you don't believe in. It, it doesn't work because their values are different than we are. God doesn't even force them. I'm not saying we should sit back and let people walk over us. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is you are, you are fighting a battle against someone that choose. They choose to turn their back on God. And there's nobody in this world that can change it, not even God himself. Because he gave you a choice, and he gave me a choice. And he gave Israel a choice, and he gave us a choice in Eden. And you saw about the rebellion. So get this idea in your head that it's a willful thing that we need to shift. It's a willful thing that we need to shift. Now we've got these little bit of hints going out in the Bible. When you read Psalms, Psalm 23 again, beautiful, but understand what the, what the narrative of the story is. Now we're going to get over to the New Testament and we see Jesus popping up on the scene. And Jesus comes and he says, the times are fulfilled. The times are fulfilled. Big words, the times are fulfilled. Referring to the whole hints, all these plans that God has been made, making and this whole, whole illustration through the nation of Israel is going to be fulfilled now and he's given Israel a chance and I don't want to be rude to them. I, I, mean, I mess up in my life as well, but they mess this whole process up a little bit. The same that we mess our lives up and then Jesus comes down and says, can I just rectify what you guys are busy with? Can I just rectify? And he comes to the nation of Israel first because God's covenant is with the nation of Israel. And thank goodness they were a stiff-necked people because of their rejection of the Messiah. The gospel was made open to the entire world. And now, as the gospel is being made open to the entire world, we pick up on these hints of Isaiah about, um, blessed are you who bring the good news. And this hints of the Son of Man whose throne will be established. This hints of Abraham that I will bless you and through you I will bless the nations. And all these things become fulfilled in the person that we know as Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We look at, um, you can put on the next slide. We, the, the, I want you to think of a couple of sermons. Yeah, you can put on um, after for Israel for me, please. John 1 verse 14. The Word became flesh. And the Word became flesh and He dwelt. He tabernacled among us. The idea of, of this law that was written word became a, a, a law with some flesh on. And Jesus comes down and they saw these hints and these miracles taking place in His life. And Jesus comes and explains something. He says, the kingdom of God has come. And how does He do that? By healing people. 
and breaking the Pharisee rules about healing people on the Sabbath. We spoke about this in depth. We see Jesus breaking the rules of this God of Israel, but actually what they were doing is they were weaponizing the, the law for their own benefit, for their own status, and God says that was never the plan, that was never the idea. And Jesus comes and He heals people and He restores them, and He talks to people that doesn't deserve to be talking to. To, talking to, I'll say. To be talking to. Proudly, I bevel in South Africa. Hallelujah. Spoken to, and Jesus, he, he, he spends time with fishermen and tax collectors and sinners and says, God is all about restoring people. And we are broken and limited, and Jesus comes and he fulfills all these things, and he says, the time has come. And we spoke about at the end of Jesus' life, where, where the road to Emmaus, where the two people walk, can you remember that sermon that I spoke about? And they, they didn't recognize Jesus when he was quoting all these scriptures that were fulfilled, they recognized Jesus the moment he took the bread and he broke the bread. And in his actions, in his love, in his service, in the, in the, 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 what's the last supper, that, that reminding of the sacrifice of Jesus, in that moment they realized that the Son of God is in front of them. And again we see these ideas that man, you can post scriptures about loving people and worshiping God and how good He is, but if you can't even love your wife, then you are wasting your time. You can post those beautiful scriptures on Facebook all day long, but if you struggle to forgive, you are wasting your time. And I'm not saying this lightly. Forgiving is, is, is very expensive. My point being is Jesus comes and says, it's more than a book thing. It's a heart thing. It's a, it's a relationship thing. So look at what I'm doing. The Son of God kneeling down to wash the feet of people who would betray Him. And then He comes and He says, now go and do the same thing. Go and do the same thing. And from there we spoke about this idea of PVP, about Peter and Paul. And after Jesus was resurrected to heaven, we, we're touching on the, the later part, um, the later part, after the Gospels, the New Testament section of the Pauline letters, where, where Paul and Peter kind of arguing about, but it's for Israelite people. They thought it was a, a, a fresh new movement in Judaism. And then Christianity didn't even exist back then because it was kind of one movement. And then later on, theologians distinguished it as a separate faith, if I can use that term. Although we don't see it that way. We see it as being part of that. But in any case, then we see this battle fighting because people felt that you need to be circumcised. You need to follow the Torah. You need to listen to the Old Testament. And then you can be saved. And Paul, uh, P, um, Saul, yeah, Paul, Saul, Paul comes and he says, no, that's not the story and the narrative of the Bible. And they had this big fight over there. And the rest of this Bible is to explain to people that the Messiah came for the entire world and to save them and to reconcile them. That's why we can have church in South Africa and we're not Jews. Because God opened the door for us to be reconciled to. And then we ended the story, but what, what is the conclusion with the story? And maybe a little bit controversial, but we looked at Mind the Step in Revelation 21 at the end of our Bible, where John writes and he says, He sees the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven and God dwelling with man again. So, this idea of us floating away and popping up somewhere, it's not really how the story ends in Revelation. What happens is there's a faithful remnant on earth. Doing the right thing when popular culture doesn't think we're doing the right thing. Staying faithful to Yahweh when it's unpopular. Sticking to this idea that Jesus came and died and, and how the, 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 the kingdom of God was established. Continuing with that. And the story circles back to Genesis where God wants to dwell with man. And He wants to be reconciled with man. And He wants to be restored to man. And I'm going to conclude. Holy moly. I'm going to conclude. That's the narrative of this, this Bible story that we read. And when I say story, I don't mean fictional. I mean there's real, real drive behind this. Act 1, the good creation. Images of God. Act 2, the rebellion. Act 3, this entire story of God and Israel. Act 4, we've got Jesus Christ coming for the people of Israel. He was... Um, um, he was crucified, he was resurrected, and then the gospel was spread. And Act 5, which is incomplete because we are still living in the story. We are still, we are the, we, the, we are the safekeepers 
of the kingdom of God. And God says it's our task to be the light and be the salt. It's our task to continue with forgiving people and being love and serving and all, all those pictures. But here's the challenge. Yes? And this is, this is what I want to conclude with. This. See, knowing this is easy. Knowing this is easy. It's, it's not complicated. When anybody can read the Bible, you can read John 3 verse 16 and you can understand what the, the story behind this is. But what do we do when what we know and what we feel clash with each other? Let me explain to you this way quickly and, and, and then I'm going to conclude. I know unhealthy food is not good for me. I know that. I know that. But guess where you will find me on a Friday afternoon after work? Any place that's got the highest cholesterol and MSG spated into them with syringes, I don't care what's in those things. Because what I know and what I feel is sometimes conflicting with each other. Can I, can I make it a little bit more serious? Some of you know you are loved. You know it. But you don't always feel loved. And so what we do is instead of acting on the no... We act on what we feel. Whether the feeling is true or not. It's a human battle that we've got. And this is why I talk about this, this whole story. and this. Sometimes we do church the way we feel instead of the way we know. Sometimes we read our Bible the way we feel instead of the way we know. You see, knowing... That church attendance adds value is one thing. But feeling like coming to church on a Sunday morning after a long Saturday night, that's a different feeling. And we tend to act on the, but that's the whole, that's the whole point. That's just the whole point. God comes and he says, I know you don't feel like keeping your tongue back. But you need to know that that is what I desire. Because the people you speak to, they matter to me. I know you don't feel like praying right now. But you know that prayer is a form of faith and a form of trust in, in God. I understand that you don't always feel like worshiping God. But we know that God is good. But the feeling is clashing. And that is what it means to be a Christian. We don't always run after the feeling. And don't get me wrong. We are human. We, we, we have feelings. We have feelings. But following Yahweh means that we know certain things and we try to fight what we feel because that's not always truth and that's not always healthy and that's not always beneficial. That's why we pray even though we don't feel like it. That's why we come to church even though we always don't feel like it. That's why Pastor Sandra serves selflessly because it's not always about how, how she feels. It's about knowing the truth in the text and understanding that this is what it means to serve in God's kingdom. Stop feeling so much. Put the feelings aside and stand in what you know. That's the, that's the challenge. That's the spiritual walk in our lives. Come on, man. You, we know the truth. It's not that it's difficult to believe in Jesus. The reality is we don't feel like believing in Jesus. Because it challenges us. Because it means I need to change many things in my life. And we don't want to put in the effort. And that is what the Israelites did. They turned away from what they knew into what they wanted to feel. And they shifted towards that. And that is what it means to rebel against God. That's the reality, and sadly, that, that is the truth. It's, it's not a thing about, I don't really, I'm not sure. It's not about not being sure. It's about you don't feel like doing it. I don't always feel like doing it. I always refer to a kerk baie wat ons aantrek en maandag ons uittrek. We refer to that, we refer to that, and I think it's quite, quite funny. Um, but the point, just, just, just get a hold of this, just, just the story. I, I I know we need some motivation in our lives and I understand that we want to feel good. I'm not saying that's bad. I'm not saying that's bad at all. I mean, we do this together because it encourages us. The, the Bible talks about edifying the saints. It talks about edifying, edifying each other. I'm not saying it's wrong. It's not saying it's wrong. But I'm just challenging you. Can you really handle what stands in the Bible? You know, people outside the church, you know, feeling one thing is because they run after their feeling. That's, that's one thing. But sometimes people in the church, because they, they struggle with this as well. 
Because we felt church is supposed to be one way. But when we read the Bible, we know it should be a different way. Can you change it back to what it should be? Or are you going to run off to what feels good for you? See, when, when you want to mess people up, you just touch on the, the traditional elements. If we talk about the communion table, if we talk about going to heaven and coming to earth, if we talk about theology, some people don't believe what stands in the Bible. <laughs> Listen to what I'm saying. Some people are so stuck in feeling that it's irrelevant what stands in the Bible. If their faith says this is what church should look like, it's that's what they and what the Bible says is irrelevant. We get so stuck in certain elements with regards to this. The conclusion, and, and I know this has been a very, very big, and I tried to make it as compact as possible. I just want you to understand that this is the bigger picture of the Bible. When you read your Bible, be careful of nitpicking small little elements out. Use your Bible. God can speak to you. He can do that. I'm not saying it's wrong. We're not talking about sin. I'm talking about there's a more important, bigger element with regards to this narrative of the Bible. And I want you to think about these pillars. These are the pillars that has been placed in our Bible. And all the other texts, they kind of flow into this. So when you read your Bible, understand there's, there's this bigger picture with regard to that. So be careful with this idea of and be careful of this idea of, of using God as a lucky charm. God is not a toy. He's not a, he's not a play thing. Um, um, he, he's established His kingdom and we have a responsibility in this kingdom. This is the bigger picture and it's our task to step up into this picture. And that's why it matters what I say tomorrow morning when I'm at work. And how I handle my neighbors. And how I conduct myself. And that's why it matters what I do when I'm alone at home behind closed doors. And it matters what I think in my mind. It matters. Because we are involved in God's kingdom and trying to make a difference. I understand and I'm going to conclude with this. Maybe it's just where, where, where I am at the moment and I don't know. I I understand that sometimes, you know, we, we, we need to feel good. But church is more than a feeling, ladies and gentlemen. Following God is more than a feeling. I understand it takes some energy and I tell you it takes some effort to put in. But understand it's not about how we feel. Our God in heaven desires to be reconciled with His people. There's a way He wants things to be done. There's information that needs to go out. We need to understand this narrative of the Bible instead of using it as a self-help book to see how we can benefit out of that. No, read the Bible to see how others can benefit from it. So I ask you to close your eyes. As your eyes are closed, I just want to say thank you for, for faithfully attending. Thank you for coming on this journey with me. It was really phenomenal this last couple of weeks, um, how the Bible has just been opening up. And I just want to challenge you with this idea of, of knowing and, and feeling. I'm going to give you an opportunity just to, and you can do it quietly, just to speak to God on your own terms right there. Just a minute and then I'm finished. Just, just pray your own prayer with regards. I just want to ask questions. Have you been misusing church? Have you been misusing His word? Have you been using His name in vain? Have you been using His Word in vain? Have you been weaponizing the Scripture? Have you been treating people not adequately as you should? Are you really a follower of Yahweh? Or do you do certain things because it feels good and comfortable to your worldview? Come on, I want you to restore your heart to God. I want you to to understand that there's an important message in the Word. And we have a responsibility towards that. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your goodness, your mercy, and your grace in our lives, Father. Father, many times, many times in my life, I just look at church and see what I can get out of it. What form of entertainment I can get out of a sermon. What form of fun feeling I can get out of the music that's being played. But Father, we want to restore our hearts to a legitimate place that is really reconciled with you. 
And if that means that's unpopular, Father, then so be it, Father. If that means it's not accepted in common culture, or it's frowned upon, Father, then so be it, Father. We're not here to play church, Father. We're not here to pick feel-good sermons, Father. But we want to understand your word. We want to change our hearts. We want to be part of your kingdom and we want to be the difference. We want to be the blessing as your son has been the blessing to us. Thank you for your faithfulness in our lives. In Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.